Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, blowing the whistle on the Pentagon. Come on. The WikiLeaks Iraq video and how the story was or was not covered. Newsrooms and their reporters dressing up television dramas. Fact meets fiction in Israel. Racial tensions in South Africa explode on the air. Quote, you bloody agent. And Whitney Houston, we have a problem. Someone in Taiwan has stolen your song. The images came from a U.S. Army helicopter and they showed an attack near Baghdad that killed 16 Iraqis, including two media workers. The video from July 2007 was released by WikiLeaks, the online whistleblowing site. A spokesman for WikiLeaks said the video was newsworthy because it took us inside the cockpit and proved that the men who ordered the attack and pulled the trigger ignored the U.S. military's own rules of engagement. And the coverage of this story has been revealing in its own way. It did not get the airtime in the United States that such an explosive piece of video clearly warranted. And Reuters, the news organization that had two employees killed in the attack, has been criticized for going easy on the Pentagon in the aftermath. Our starting point this week is a story that broke in Washington and rippled out from there. And what the coverage of the video says about news organizations and the way they cover the U.S. military. Looking at it, it was someone acting like God. That's a weapon, yeah. They are superhuman, while Iraqi people were subhuman. They have individuals with weapons. They are high in the sky, shooting at uh, lower people. Light them all up. Come on, fire. It's uh, absolutely... For me, it was inhuman. Regardless of what you make of this video, what you know about military rules of engagement, whether you believe the soldiers really mistook cameras for grenade launchers, whether it was a war crime or just an honest, tragic mistake, the video was shocking. It was disturbing and it was news. Or at least, it should have been. Hotel 26 is Crazy Horse 1 -8. What I find more interesting is the mainstream media reaction here in the United States because they've hardly covered the story at all. It's a fascinating story. It's an amazing story, and yet there's almost no coverage of it. Why is that? And why didn't it get released uh, to one of the networks? Why did WikiLeaks have to do it? It's because the networks wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. To be fair, the New York Times had some very excellent coverage of the story. I think on television, Fox News, which is very conservative, is uh, really not going to touch any story that sheds the Iraq war in a bad light. A closer look at the raw video revealed a few things that WikiLeaks, to put it politely, missed. MSNBC, which is of course the very liberal network, was very happy to cover it because it shed the Iraq war in a negative light. The classified video is from a U.S. Apache helicopter. And then on CNN, they really played down what had happened and they really kind of uh, tried to talk about it without really talking about it. But people online were talking about CNN's coverage. This American blogger was tracking news sites and noticed the story was initially prominent on CNN's and popular with visitors. But then it disappeared. But CNN, all day almost, they had Tiger Woods and do people love their iPads as their top story. But you look at the links, you can see the most popular story by far is video shows journalists deaths in Iraq. The bloggers point, since when do news sites which make money when visitors click on their articles take down their most popular story? The media is not anymore just newspapers and television and radio, but it is the internet, bloggers, there are source watchers, and they playing very important role in, in widening the meaning of the media. But now let's actually look at the, the video and how they covered it. Let's take a look. CNN ran one minute and ten seconds of the video, including audio from the cockpit to commanders on the ground, but it did not show pictures of the original attack or of a second attack when a passing van pulled over to help the wounded. Let's bring in our Barbara Starr, our Pentagon correspondent. Uh, Barbara, this video, uh, what do we see from it? Because it looks like they were asking for permission to engage. That means to fire 
but we don't actually see the uh, shots being fired. We do not, Wolf. Out of respect for the families of the two Iraqi employees of the Reuters news organization that were killed in this, we are not showing uh, after the video that you just saw here. It gets very brutal. Uh, Out of respect for the families, overhead. she said. However, that same day, Al Jazeera spoke to the brother of the Reuters photographer who was killed. He consented to that interview. He wanted to speak. And a few days later, a CNN reporter based in Baghdad spoke to the families as well. The whole family was in pain, says Samer. His report showed them watching the video, but again, CNN did not show viewers the actual attacks. So if the network wasn't holding back the video out of respect for the families, was it, as has been suggested, holding it back out of respect for the Pentagon? For news agencies operating in Iraq and, and even more so now in Afghanistan, access is, is a key issue. It is in the interests of news agencies not to completely go against the Pentagon's line because they need that access. They need that access that the Army provides. A couple of more points from the CNN Pentagon correspondent. They reminded everybody they did investigate. No one was found at fault. Even Reuters today put out a statement reminding everybody war, very sad, very dangerous business, especially for the journalists who try and cover it. That Reuters statement was a story in itself. The video, it said, was difficult and disturbing to watch, tragic and emblematic of the extreme dangers that exist covering war zones. But the company, which failed in previous attempts to acquire the video, held back from criticizing the Pentagon. Gawker.com, a New York-based media blog, then reported that Reuters staffers felt the statement did not go nearly far enough. Reuters did not respond to our request for an interview, but the company's former chief editor, Michael Rupke, appeared on another blog saying, the flabby response to the shameful murder of Namir Nur el-Din and Saeed Shamak by reckless U.S. forces is not reassuring. What of their families? Why, he said of Reuters, do we leave it to others to make the running? It was a question one could put not only to Reuters, but to most of the U.S. broadcast media that either ignored the story or gave it short shrift. Come on. I mean, since 2003, you had six or seven years of the Bush administration just wrapping themselves in the flag of the military and turning the Iraq invasion into such a partisan, such a hotly politicized issue. Oh, yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. Anything touching on that such as this story with uh, this terrible video uh, in East Baghdad, is going to be very controversial. And for that reason, a lot of news agencies are going to be wary of touching it. And that's a shame. They have no interest in challenging our government or our military whatsoever. And it's because that's not what they're doing anymore. They're the corporate media. They're here to entertain. They're here to make money off their advertisers. But they are not here to do journalism. One small child wounded over. And what WikiLeaks did was journalism. Here's how our Global Village voices see the coverage of the WikiLeaked U.S. military video. The Pentagon obviously had to conceal the video. Footage like this is of utmost importance. It exposes a true face of U.S. hegemonies. Perhaps this also shows all military actions, routine or not, are recorded and therefore will eventually be available to all of us to see. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're tired of screaming at your television set, you might want to try talking to your webcam. We're always looking for new Global Village voices. The best way to get in touch is through Facebook and Twitter. Just go to those sites and look for the listening post page. We will let you know what stories we're working on so you can weigh in with an opinion on the coverage. Or you can reach us through email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post and News Bites. A Japanese cameraman has become the first journalist killed in the clashes between soldiers and anti-government protesters in Thailand. Hiro Muramoto worked for the Reuters news agency, which we mentioned earlier in relation to that Iraq WikiLeaks story. Muramoto was shot in the chest covering the fighting in Bangkok. The red-shirted protesters are members of the National United Front of Democracy Against Dictatorship, they're demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Abhisit Vejajiva. They support the former PM, Taksin Shinawat, who was ousted in a military-led coup in 2006. It is not clear who was responsible for Muramoto's killing. Each side is blaming the other. 
According to various news sources, this is the last video that the cameraman recorded before he was shot and killed. Reuters' editor-in-chief, David Schlesinger, issued this statement. Journalism can be a terribly dangerous profession as those who try to tell the world the story thrust themselves in the center of the action. The entire Reuters family will mourn this tragedy. The Somali Islamist movement, Al-Shabaab, has banned radio stations in the country from broadcasting news programs that are produced by the British Broadcasting Corporation and the Voice of America. Al-Shabaab said in a statement that all FM stations in the area that they control, which is most of southern and central Somalia, including parts of the capital Mogadishu, must stop broadcasting programs made by the two outlets or face having their stations shut down and their equipment confiscated. The organization accused the BBC of confusing Muslims by broadcasting Western ideologies, as well as siding with the transitional federal government. The BBC denied that, saying it is strictly impartial in the conflict. The Voice of America, which is funded by the U.S. government, is having all kinds of difficulties in Northeast Africa these days. Last month, Ethiopia's Prime Minister Meles Zanawi admitted that his government has been deliberately blocking VOA signals for what he called engaging in destabilizing propaganda. The murder in South Africa of Eugene Terre Blanche, the one-time far-right leader, has been followed by some fireworks in the country's media. The story led to a political debate on social inequality. It was aired on ETV, the only privately owned news channel in South Africa. Do you care about the starving millions of African people in this country? I Do you care most... about the farm workers who are being oppressed in this country? I Do you care no, no, about no, the don't, fact... don't interrupt me. I'm... A member of Terre Blanche's party, Andre Visahi, stormed off the stage at one point before coming back to make a few more comments. He ended up getting into it with the host of the show, Chris Madolain. Touch me and you'll be in trouble. Touch me on my studio. You touched me! Eventually, security guards were called in to settle things down. Another incident took place at a news conference held by Julius Malema, the head of the youth wing of the ruling African National Congress. He's been accused of inciting racial violence. Don't come here with that white tendency. Malema took issue with a question from BBC correspondent Jonah Fisher. He gave him some verbal abuse in return and then had Fisher thrown out of the news conference. Quote, you bloody agent! Tensions between the media and South African politicians seem to be on the rise, and that does not bode well for the World Cup, which starts in June and will bring journalists into the country in huge numbers. Britain has taken a leaf out of France's book and approved plans to crack down on web piracy by passing a law that will mean the suspension of Internet connections for repeat offenders. This new law gives the government the right to block a web location that a judge is satisfied has been is being or is likely to be used for or in connection with an activity that infringes copyright. The legislation comes on the heels of heavy lobbying by the music and film industries which say that unauthorized copying over the net is costing them huge money. France already has a similar law which has not proved very popular and has been criticized by those who advocate free speech. We're back after the break with a piece on an Israeli kidnap show that's causing a stir in the media there. We're going to look now at a storytelling device that we're seeing more and more often in feature films and television dramas, the use of real-life news people and their news organizations in works of fiction. Now, screenwriters like this technique because it gives their story a realistic feel, the real-life reporters like the face time that they get, and their news organizations enjoy the exposure. But there's a series on Israeli TV that takes this idea into new territory, and not everyone's entirely comfortable with it. The show is called Kidnapped, and it deals with Israeli soldiers who have been abducted. Soldiers' kidnappings are a live issue in Israel. Seven soldiers are still missing, so taking that topic and turning it into a drama series is already an edgy idea. And when the channel that airs the show then allows its own real-life newsroom to be used in the series, people start asking questions about the ethics of mixing fact with fiction. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on Kidnapped and the newsroom and journalists who double as props on prime time television. I think Kidnapped is not just another TV show. They would talk about this uh, series for weeks and weeks and weeks before it actually was aired. As an Israeli, it's drawn my attention and it's drawn pretty much the attention of anybody that I've spoken with. Even before the show aired, there was already a very heated debate in the Israeli public and the Israeli media regarding the actual airing of this kind of show. Saturday night, 
and Kidnapped, the latest entrant on Israel's evening TV drama lineup, has more than a quarter of the viewing public tuning in. The basic concept of the, the show is there are three Israeli soldiers. They are taken captive 17 years ago. In captivity, they go through all sorts of torture, and uh, after 17 years, they return home. Two of them are alive, one is dead. And the show, therefore, is really about the readjustment into Israeli society and into their families. I was very impressed by its level of production, by uh, the acting. I think in the last few years we see really good cinematic uh, and television product coming out of, out of Israel. If there ever was a surefire ratings winner in Israel, this is it. The issue of kidnapped soldiers is ever present in Israeli discourse. And then there's the case of the 2006 abduction of Corporal Gilad Shalit by Hamas. Four years after the event, he is still headline news in Israel. The now 22-year-old soldier has been held captive by the Hamas terror organization in Gaza since his abduction in a cross-border raid by Palestinian terrorists on June 25, 2006. Gilad Shalit is being held captive now and that he's part of everyday evening news, a very big part of the public discussion in Israel. There was not enough time to process the Gilad Shalit story, to have the um, distance from it in, in order to just regard it as another TV show. Some people were feeling that um, the producers of the series were insensitive towards the family of Gilad Shalit, who is still being held captive, and to families of other prisoners of war. There was a feeling that the suffering and the emotional turbulence of these families is being marketed to the viewers for rating, and that Channel 2 is trying to make money for rating. When I first saw the trailer, my gut instinct was, my God, are they really serious that this is the kind of show that they want to air right now, uh, given that Gilad Shalit has been in captivity for almost four years, and. Uh, the events of the, the past two years and all of uh, the events before that. The script is written in a way that blends fact and fiction, reality and reconstruction. Watch the news breaks that happen in the series. The sets, the journalists, all look very authentic. Amidst the media scrum outside the airport, where the kidnapped soldiers are due to return, you can see other news networks featured as well. Al Jazeera, France's TF1. This isn't just good set dressing and casting at work. There is a certain degree of uh, incorporation of um, reality visuals into the fiction. So the production was using the real news studios of Channel 2. So whenever there's a news break in, it looks exactly the same because it is the same. Also, some real journalists are taking part. And they're playing themselves or they're playing news anchors and so on. Other stations have done the same thing. CNN, Fox News, even BBC, they've all appeared in some way or another in television shows or in movies. Maybe not specifically the anchor people themselves, but I think people can tell the difference between when an anchor person is playing a part and when they're actually giving the news. Paxman versus Swain. It's been done by the BBC. A scene from their comedy series, The Thick of It, shows a character being interviewed on the flagship current affairs show Newsnight by one of the BBC's most high-profile hosts, Jeremy Paxman. And in the 1997 movie Contact, CNN's Larry King interviewed actor Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, I sure have, Larry. But Contact was a science fiction movie about communicating with aliens, and The Thick of It is a comedy, a satire, the storyline for Kidnapped is based on a real current issue, and the families of the soldiers still missing have a stake in this matter. I think it is inappropriate that any uh, entertainment show, drama show, comedy, whatever, uses Channel 2 TV room as part of the show, which happens all the time in the commercial TV. It doesn't have anything to do with this delicate subject. I, th I think it has to do with the fact that the reporters in this way, they, be they become actors or entertainers, and the their line between entertainment and news is being blurred in a very dangerous way. And even the show's creators are aware of just how powerful an impact their series is likely to have. We requested an interview with the creator, Gideon Raff, and were turned down. But he did speak to the Jerusalem Post. Now, I can say that the conversation I had with the creator, he said that he came up with this idea two years ago. He said that he hoped this would help uh, create an awareness 
among the Israeli public about what would happen if Israel lets their soldiers just sit in captivity. What would happen if they do not agree to a prisoner swap? Well, what will happen is this incredible uh, trauma which is being played out in this series. And so I think that in Mr. Raff's mind, this will then uh, potentially help trigger people to think in the right direction that we need to return our soldiers as quickly as possible. Kidnapped has captured an audience and the idea has been sold to Fox TV in the US. So for the producers, examining the abduction issue and blending fact with fiction has proved to be a winning and lucrative formula. More Global Village Voices now on Israel's ambiguous TV show. For me, it was really difficult to see the uh, promos for, for that show. I really thought it was serious, like about Gilad Shalit. I'm not sure uh, now is the time to show these uh, things on uh, national TV when uh, there's a soldier sitting for three years in captivity. Finally, you may remember the story we did on the Susan Boyle phenomenon. She's the middle-aged singer from Scotland who set the internet alight when almost exactly a year ago, she blew away the audience on a TV talent show. So remember this name, Lin Yu Chun. He's a 24-year-old shopkeeper from Taiwan, and his televised version of a Whitney Houston track is clocking up some very big numbers on the net. We are predicting a major recording contract in his future and probably a makeover. We're leaving you now with our web video of the week, and we'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Yo yeah.